Why are some people frantically saving their money, while others, like me, spend it on daily coffee-to-goes and new clothes? In my research, I look at an important factor that affects how much people will buy and save, the amount of earnings risk they face. Earnings risk is a very broad concept. It comprises of the probability that you will lose your job next year, but also whether you will get a promotion, and actually anything related to the uncertainty about your future earnings. So how does this earnings risk affect your saving decisions? Well, for example, if you think that you will likely lose your job next year, you will not book a fancy cruise for this summer. Instead, you'll put away some money and save it for who knows what. And this, so how much you buy or save, and how this depends on earnings risk, it matters for me, as it is my research question, but it also matters to politicians and other decision makers. Why? Well, for example, if the Minister of Finance wants to stimulate the economy during a crisis and gives people money, then the Minister hopes that these people will spend it, because that boosts the economy. However, some people will instead save their money, and they will not spend it, because they might be afraid to lose their job. And in that case, the policy doesn't help the economy. The policy is ineffective. So we want to understand how much people buy and save. And for that, we need to know how much earnings risk they face. The problem is, I cannot observe your earnings risk. I cannot observe the probability that you will lose your job next year or get a promotion. However, you likely have a pretty good guess yourself and you will use that information to make your saving decisions. And this is the idea I use in my research. I have data available on the saving decisions that people make, and from this I deduce how much earnings risk these people face. I analyze how much this risk differs across people and over time. I have two main findings. First, I find that there are large differences in the earnings risk that people face. While 80% of people with a job face low risk, the other 20% faces a different reality, being up to eight times as likely to lose their job. Second, I find that the periods of high earnings risk typically are short. So people that face high levels of risk typically are of a low risk type in the year after. Concluding, people strongly differ with respect to something that we cannot directly observe, the earnings risk they face, and it affects how much they spend and save. This insight can help policymakers to make their policies more effective. Thank you. Did you know that every year in the Netherlands alone, one in a hundred people are diagnosed with cancer? And that one in three don't survive? That's 50,000 deaths, equivalent to every visitor to the music festival Lowlands dying every year. My name is Yoni, and I wish for everyone, everywhere, to have a long and healthy life. Together with researchers from the University of Amsterdam and doctors from the Netherlands Cancer Institute, we develop and implement artificial intelligence models to improve cancer patient care. Although standard treatments like chemo and radiotherapy work for some, they unfortunately don't work for all, and they often cause nasty side effects. But luckily, for some patients, their chance of survival can be much higher using something called immunotherapy. This activates the patient's own immune system to attack the tumor cells and has very few side effects. But the treatment is expensive and still doesn't work for everyone. And at the moment, it's difficult to know for sure which patient would benefit. And it requires costly and imperfect additional tests. But we think we don't need additional tests because what's done in every hospital already is to remove part of the tumor in surgery to look at a very thin slice of the tumor under the microscope, which looks like this. 
And we believe that we can see from the positions and shape of different types of cells in an image like this, if the tumor would respond to immunotherapy. But we don't yet know how we can recognize this, because as you can see, when we zoom out, there's an overwhelming number of cells to look at, even for one patient. But artificial intelligence can help us find the patterns that predict which patient would benefit from immunotherapy. I understand that artificial intelligence sometimes sounds a bit like magic, but really it's an algorithm that can look at all the cells of many, many patients of whom we know if immune therapy worked or didn't work. And then it learns to recognize which type of cells in these images are related to a good response. Using these learned patterns, we can then let the algorithm analyze a new image of a new patient from anywhere in the world and quickly and cheaply predict if the patient would benefit. As a result of our research so far, we've already gotten better at recognizing elements of the cancer DNA in this type of image that we know are related to immune therapy response. And the next step is to make these models even smarter and to test how well the predictions work for hospitalized patients all over the world. And by continuing this research hand in hand with doctors, we strongly believe that in the near future, our methods can be used every day by doctors worldwide to make better treatment decisions quicker. And with the best possible treatment, many of those low lens visitors get to enjoy this festival called life for many more years. Thank you. In 2016, I had an accident and I broke several bones. And for two years, doctors and lawyers discussed how these injuries would affect the rest of my life and the amount of money I should receive in compensation for this accident. At the end of that long and emotional process, I came across a similar story that happened to a French man named Jacques Ma over 600 years ago. He too was injured by someone else and lost three fingers. Trying to understand what happened to Jacques Ma after this injury led me to discover a tribunal from the Middle Ages called the Pacification Court that you can see represented here. This court, just like in my case, gathered lawyers and doctors to discuss the consequences that losing his fingers would have on the life of Jacques Ma. They determined that the injury would prevent Jack Ma from keeping his job as a carpenter and that he should receive a sum of money each year until his death. This story shows two important things. First, that welfare and forensic medicine, which both seem very modern and very familiar to us, already existed more than 600 years ago. Second, that injuries and their consequences were an important concern in the Middle Ages as this image also suggests. The Pacification Court worked as a welfare system very similar to ours. It paid for doctors to treat injuries and prevent disabilities, and it relied on forensic medicine to offer money to disabled people. Here, you can see people taking care of a disabled child in a medieval manuscript. Preventing disabilities was essential because a healthy population was necessary to produce food and goods. This is especially true for the Middle Ages, where production was more complicated, more time-consuming and more costly than it is now. Simple household items, such as a blanket, could cost up to a year of salary for a middle-class individual. This means that the Pacification Court was a way to make sure that goods were available and that injured people could still buy the things they needed. It is easy to think that people in the Middle Ages were indifferent to violence and disability. Medieval is often used to describe cultures that are different from ours in a negative way. It can be used to justify trying to fix these cultures by imposing our views on them. 
By showing that medieval does not mean dark or violent, I hope to change this perception. Just like the Middle Ages were not dark ages, these cultures don't need to be fixed because they are not broken. It walks like a state, it talks like a state. Sometimes it makes rules and it breaks rules, just like a state. But it's not a state. And it's also not just an international organization. Now the European Union has for long been seen as something unique, something different. But what does this really matter on the global stage? How has the European Union positioned itself internationally in a world of nearly 200 states, the European Union is but a group of 27. But what it does on the global stage affects our everyday lives. In 2017, tens of thousands marched in capitals across Europe against CETA and TTIP. In 2015, the signing of the Paris Agreement was hailed as a turning point for global climate action. But is the European Union really shaping global rules. When it comes to rules that apply not just to international organizations, but to states at large, does the EU have something to say? And what it says, does it matter? This is the itch underlying my research. My name is Teresa Cabrita, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Amsterdam Center for International Law and the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance. In my research, I look at how the European Union has tried to convince a very specific group of international lawyers about the leading role it has to play in global affairs. I look at how it has struck a conversation with the United Nations International Law Commission, a group of lawyers, diplomats and legal scholars trying to identify the common rules that govern and the rules that should govern international affairs. This conversation has been a long one. It started way back in the 1970s and it's still going on today. My research offers the first systematic analysis of all the statements made by the European Union concerning the work of this United Nations body. Because what the European Union says internationally matters. At a point in time where international organizations are increasingly active in making, but at times also breaking, international rules? What has the EU had to say about the rules that govern the responsibility of international organizations, or even the protection of migrants? Now, if it walks like a state, and if it talks like a state, is the EU also shaping global rules just like a state? Has it claimed to be bound by the same rules or by different ones? And if so, to what consequence? This is what I invite you to find out with me, one conversation at a time.